take it set up for failure. <laughs> uh, so how many have heard about program anarchy? Have seen the presentation? Oh, a little over half. Okay. Um, so so it's basically what I'm going to talk more about that and how we how we playing somewhere else. We'll get into the context of that a bit. One of the things I like to talk about is this is my real experience. So I don't talk about something theoretical. I talk, talk about what I've actually done. Uh, I'm a sort of a hands-on implementer programmer for many, many, many years. Um, so these represent basically my experiences both at Mail Online, which is the uh, Daily Mail's online version. Um, if you read it, you don't have to confess to it. Um, <laughs> it's sort of like a train wreck. You just can't not watch it for some reason. Um, it is the largest online newspaper in the world right now. We passed the New York Times last year. So, uh, as, 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 as you might think of uh, the type of news we tend to show in that, and yet it is the most popular in the world. Uh, been there since September. And of course, a lot of this stuff is my experience is at my previous company, which was Forward Internet Group, which was a, basically a startup, sort of a 35 person startup, but I joined them uh, about five or six years ago now. And when I left, there were about 500 people. Uh, so they grew quite aggressively. One of the reasons that I left was to get, go try out some of these ideas about programming anarchy somewhere else. And so the mail online is kind of that crucible for doing that. Uh, I'll get a little bit more of that. But tonight in particular, I'm going to you know, sort of briefly hit a couple of topics. Uh, I will review what programming anarchy is, because about half of you haven't seen it. I'm not going to draw a lot on it. Uh, find me afterwards if you'd like to talk about it. I'll talk briefly about why it's working really well. And then I'll sort of talk about how we actually got it working at Mail Online, uh, quite an established enterprise. So just to set the tone for program anarchy, um, I'm a strong believer in the Agile Manifesto. Um, uh, I've been doing extreme programming since even before this was actually written. Uh, and these are things we actually, I fundamentally believe in and the organizations I work in also believe in. I think my favorite list of things to look at is, is, is the XP values as espoused by uh, Kent Beck in, in some of his books. Uh, I really believe that these are the things that make it really work. If you get all these things right, it is just fun to work in this environment. And one of the nice things about being bright and being a programmer is you should be having fun at work. And when you're not having fun, it's usually something like this that's being messed up. And again, we believe in all of those. And then it gets a little strange in programming anarchy, because you sort of list out, now that you believe in the Agile Manifesto, now that you believe in all these Agile um, principles and theories and values, you sort of see this list of Agile practices. And this turned out to be a list of things we did not do uh, at the Ford Internet. Uh, and this sort of raised the question about what were you doing? I mean, how can you believe in everything else and then throw all of these things, which are kind of like fundamental at some level, off the list. And that's what the Program Anarchy presentation talks about to some degree. So I'm going to surf through that really quickly, but if you want a longer version, this is a one hour version, it's actually on the, on the web and you can access it quite readily. One of the things we talk about is though, uh, there's a difference between Agile and Waterfall in terms of the trust relationship between ourselves and our stakeholders. As programmers, I saw this diminish over time with Waterfall for very good reasons. Waterfall diminished because Things got bigger, the business got more complicated. The applications we were writing across you know, the period of waterfall had diminished quite a bit. It had gigantic applications. We started outsourcing to foreign countries. Trust relationships were also just destroyed. They got worse and worse. Agile has been doing a nice job really rebuilding this. And Agile, like, I mean Agile, I mean almost all its names it comes under. Because I think Agile has to take a new name every few years. They call it Lean and Kanban, it's sort of cool words right now. To my way of thinking, it still means the same thing. I don't mind that you have a new name for it, because I think it's just every time you put a new name on it, some new books get written, some new people believe in it, and that means for the rest of us, we get, we get this more positive environment. One of my colleagues in uh, my last company, uh, Mark Durant, pointed out that there's a gap between where the waterfall companies are and where you need to be to be successful in Agile. And I actually played in this space for about 10 years in consulting, trying to figure out how to get a company that's sitting down here in the very untrustworthy state to the point where I actually even run an Agile project at all. And a lot of things that inhibit the Agile process from working 
are things about the organization that have been designed around the waterfall. Titles of people, uh, organizations like project offices, uh, process books, process teams, have all centered around the concept of waterfall. And in order to be successful in an agile space, you have to kill them. And they don't die very readily. Uh, and so I'm going to give you an example of some of that. Uh, I'm going to come back to some of the, uh, some of the uh, examples of that. But in fact, when you get to what I'm beginning to call programmer anarchy, there's yet a higher level of trust and even agile that's required. Which means you really, really got to be convincing that this is a good idea with these people. And it sort of, it sort of points out quite readily where this comes in. Um, we look at a requirements hierarchy, and again, I have another colleague from ThoughtWorks, Greg Reiser, who he and I were working on an engagement, sort of came up with this pyramid. And it basically says that in requirements, there are about five tiers of requirements coming in. Stories are basically created at the fourth level, and we take stories and we're supposed to break them down into smaller tasks, which is kind of the fifth level. But there are also some higher levels of that. There's this concept, maybe you call it features, and these are part of overall projects. And projects are part of some overall business initiatives. And this agile, actually this requirement pyramid has been very powerful in the agile space. In fact, it was one of my favorite things to talk about with enterprises. Because if you can go to an enterprise and say, all the work I'm doing can be traced back to this business initiative, they fall in love with you. Because in the waterfall process, they take a requirement from here and over here and over here and over here, and they put it all in one piece of code, and they give it to the guy and say, well, which part is working for what part? This would fail to fall to this. And that whole process takes a lot of time, a lot of people, and there's a lot of finger pointing. But when a story relates to a feature, relates to a project, relates to a business initiative, we have traceability. And if you ever get involved in the horrible stuff in the States called suborn oxygen or SOX, which is where they put people in jail if, they can't, if something goes wrong with the systems, uh, and they don't know about it, uh, this actually just nails SOX. Because SOX says, I've got to be able to tell me everything and, and who did it and why they do it. And this gives them that traceability. Now, Agile came in and basically said, this is the story, the level you want to work in. And basically, Scrum talks about this. Uh, XP talks about this. Stories is the level of interaction we have with our clients. And that's a theory. In practice, as I go out and look at various Agile shops, what you find is it's drifted down. It's drifted down in a very ugly fashion. That in fact, because the stories didn't deliver correctly, all of a sudden the project manager is starting to manage at the task level. Who's working on this task? How many hours did it take? How many hours should it have taken? If you start answering those questions, there's just more questions. Why did it only take two hours? I thought you said it was going to take three hours. They keep asking more questions. And in fact, it almost destroys the ability for programmers to really think about what they're doing and having fun. But if this is the agile tier where you want to work in, in anarchy, we work at this level. It's pretty much, we want to go to the client and say, tell me what you want to accomplish, and then get the hell out of my way. And that's why it provides a higher level of trust associated with it. We want to interact with that level. If the team wants to use stories to do things, that's our business. We're not going to surface those stories to the client. We're not going to set prioritization meetings with the client. We're not going to have interesting planning meetings with the client. We're just trying to get the job done. With anarchy. Now the other thing that's went on with agile roles is I've talked about this, you know, especially in the last ten years, about the various roles associated with agile practices. And you can sort of say they kind of fall into three big categories: management roles, there's the business roles, and development roles. And there's all sorts of names associated with these various people. So we have tons of names over here. In fact, I don't, I don't even list them all, but there's been tons of names been generated associated with labeling programmers. And to some degree, as you stare at these and stare at some of these other roles, these are actually names of the steps of the waterfall process. And the more you think about that, the more you realize these are not necessarily great names for things working in an agile space. And most of the agile practices have actually done a nice job. They kind of said basically you kind of bleed all these together, we just want to talk about developers. The distinction between an architect and a designer and a developer and a, and those, you just kind of bleed all that stuff because we're trying to just treat ourselves more that way. And to some degree you get some bleeding over here as well. Notice by the way I put QA or slash testers over in this corner of the triangle. Because these guys are actually thinking about it from the story level, the business side. So they're much more on the business side. 
And you see a lot of times customers serving this role because they understand it at this level. So what does it look like at Anarchy? So you sort of take some of those key roles we just looked at. In Anarchy, yes, we have customers and programmers, but we have eliminated all of those other roles. We have killed the project managers off. We've taken out the business analysts. We've taken out the testers. <coughs> And in fact, we've actually wiped out the managers and the programmers completely. They're gone as well. Hence the name Anarchy. Now, some people say, well, how do these developers, these developers have to be more efficient if I had some more people. So if I have five developers and I have these three or four other guys, you know, managers and testers, that's got to be a more productive team than just five programmers. I say, sure. But it's not more productive than taking that same money and hiring eight programmers. Eight programmers will beat five programmers, no matter how many managers they have to tell them what to do. In fact, maybe probably beats them easily. But it's not the fact that, that these other managers are not providing some value, it's just that more value is if you replace these guys with real developers. Yes, these developers may make some mistakes that the QA might check, or maybe a project manager, but not to the tune of three or four people's worth of mistakes. The arithmetic actually favors having the eight programmers making a few mistakes versus five programmers that would never make any mistakes. And we know five programmers with the right management will never make a mistake. <laughs> so where does these other roles go? What happens to them? So you sort of start out, let's start out with the QA guy in particular. So you look at the QA guy and you sort of say, what does QA look like today? Not in 1970 and 75 when I was beginning to write code and we had this role established. What does it look like today? Well, the first thing you realize is all the tools are programming tools. There's Selenium, there's Cucumber, there's a whole raft of the tools like that. And you have to write code. You have to be a programmer in order to use these tools. If you're a bad programmer, you write bad tests. So you need good programmers. And what about the systems we're trying to test now? They're complicated. They use external services that are running in line. There, there's six or eight pieces of them. How does a, a tester sort of understand your relationships unless he has almost architectural integrity associated with this? He understands architectural principles. Let's see. Understands architecture, understands design, can write code. Gee, sounds like a programmer to me. <laughs> and hence the distinction between a programmer and a QA doesn't exist anymore. The QAs are no longer those people that are just you know, pressing buttons and, and looking at screens and running batch jobs for you blindly because they have to understand anything, they have to understand things any other programmer has to understand. And so the distinction about QA sort of falls out because the role doesn't make sense anymore. We've also made a shift in these systems, particularly the ones I've been working in, where acceptance test is not really a good idea. This is something, a test I'm going to run one time before I deploy, and this will give me certainty that the deployed system will work fine. But the deploy system is hooking to all these external services, and it's a complex system in its own right. So wouldn't we rather have a set of acceptance sets, wouldn't we rather write some active monitoring of that system? Now you may use the same tools, you may still use a Cucumber or Selenium to keep testing the system constantly, but you want something that's running all the time. One of my colleagues who works at a, in a trading firm, uh, they do the same sort of thing. They basically have given up completely on acceptance testing in a financial trading firm. Instead, they'll put out the system really quickly and start pumping $100 transactions through it. Let's go spend $100, buy some IBM stock. Let's turn around and sell it for $90. $90. Fine. I just lost $10. But I know the system is working. All the pieces are working. So when I push that $100,000 sale through, I'm confident it will work. And it turns out that $10 loss per thing is easily cheaper than hiring a big bunch of people, delay, delay, putting acceptance tests in place. It's so much, much cheaper just to do that. So we've had a, a shift from acceptance testing into this concept of active monitoring. So that's what's kind of happened to QA. So we go back to our picture, and now QA is gone. And let's look at BAs. So what is a BA? Originally, in the dark ages, when I came up, BA was a guy who understood the business. He's a business analyst. He understands financial systems. He understands retail. He understands supply chain. But somehow, that's not what happened in the agile space. In theory, he was the guy the partner would go to to teach him about the domain. 
I'd ask, he'd tell me about the domain. And if I had a question, 